Um, thank you very much for your attendance today, folks. It's fantastic to have a, a substantial number of you with us here today to look at V24. Now, um, Autodesk updated the uh, AutoCAD at the end of March and uh, Civil 3D came, I think, within a, uh, like a week of, of that particular update. Um, and uh, we in the wings had kind of our version uh, ready to go, which meant that Thursday last week we did our release, um, which meant that we've got um, compatibility with AutoCAD and Civil 3 2024. And also the update then works on the um, the other platform that we've got, which is Brits CAD and our OEM version or integrated version, which is Civil Side Design Plus. And the same goes with um, our sister product, Stringer, as well. All the updates happen for that as well. And there'll be a future webcast on Stringer updates, um, I think, early May. OK, so we've got a, a couple of weeks to wait before you get the Stringer webinar. So what has gone into this release? So we've got really, um, I'd say probably four, well, let's say three new features, um, one of which was technically in the previous release, 23.1, and I'll show you that one in a minute, and an improvement. And really, the main uh, new feature that we're going to be highlighting today is tool space. And uh, the thing about uh, this is that it, it's just, a, for us, uh, or I believe it's a game changer for how um, users operate civil site design. The big one, and I've been using this in training, um, even yesterday doing some web training, and I've been using this through even just preparation for webinars and other bits and pieces. Um, I've just been using tool space almost constantly. Um, you almost get to the point where you're not going to need to use the ribbon um, if you get the hang of using it. It's an incredible um, way of being able to operate the software. Um, it, namely, as I put there, improving the access to commands, just simply right clicking on everything um, to find what you're after is a huge, huge step forward. Being able to see everything that's in a job, the amount of people that I know you, that use certain functions on the ribbon to go and find certain content or list certain content, such as strings in their project. Good one would be the, um, the delete string tool just to go and see what's in your job um, is, 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 is not having to do that anymore. This is really good. OK. One of the benefits of this is obviously, um, you, when you'll see in a minute, there's exposure to a lot of contextual commands. Um, so there's been a lot of content added in over the years. And I think kind of the usability of civil site design has, or the ease of use in inverted commas, has gradually inadvertently sort of diminished as we've we've added new, new features and new tools and new functionality, all of which is obviously excellent. Um, that kind of ease of finding that content and operating with it, I think, has 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 yeah has diminished. So, um, finding tools and functions now related to a particular feature can all be uh, literally at your fingertips. Meaning that yes, it's more accessible for new and established users. So, if you're a brand new user, you've never seen our software before, you can pretty much operate it directly from the tool space. That is the data tab. Now, you're actually looking at the Civil 3D and the BricsCAD version. Now, for the for for those of you that are sort of fairly wily-eyed here, you probably will notice there is only one significant difference. That one significant difference is the corridor models. Okay, that's really the only difference between the two. They operate in the same fashion. The resources tab um, replaces the welcome screen, and I can hear a groan in the background of people that are going, oh no, you've taken away my splash screen. Where is it? I love that splash screen. I love it popping up and having to tell it to go away every day or setting it to never. Um, which was the big bugbear of mine, because it does contain a lot of good stuff. Um, we've actually just put it on a tab. So um, you can sit there at, at your heart's content, jump into the YouTube channel, the blog, which is actually a real blog now, uh, for those of you that uh, have downloaded. In fact, I meant to put a survey for that. Maybe we'll do a raise hands in a minute for those that have downloaded it. Um, a blog, um, we've got the webinar, uh, which this webinar will be uh, on a YouTube playlist. That will be sitting in here. We've also added the released, uh, excuse me, the release playlist, which basically means any videos related to V24, and there are other playlists related to other releases, are uh, in the one spot. So if you want to kind of do a bit of a catch up, bit of a recap on what's gone in the past couple of releases, um, and there has been a lot, um, then you can jump into the release playlist in uh, on YouTube. A couple of extra things um, you may not have spotted down the bottom, but there's a kind of a quick reference FAQ. There are some very typical questions that we get a lot from users. A good one is how do I stop the data folder being created regularly or why does the text not fit in the forms? And that's related to 4K screens, all those bits and pieces. This will actually open just a quick little PDF uh, with about nine or 10 uh, different um, sort of very typical questions. And that is a live document, which whenever you click on that, it will download it. And if there's been some updates, you'll be able to see them. And then the other one is the Toolspace feedback survey. Now, as this has been developed, 
uh, the the question around how users operate the software and would like to operate the software in the future, um, that question has been raised. And we thought, well, who better to ask than the users themselves as to how they like to operate the software and would like to continue operating the software through the um, through the tool space and the ribbons. So there is about five questions in there or six questions where you can actually just go and quickly answer. Tell us what you think of uh, the interface as it is um, with tool space in there and how you might like to see it change in the, in the future. Um, but uh, look, any feedback there is valuable. I don't suggest you download it immediately and fill that survey in. Actually have a play with tool space first, get used to it, and then tell us, um, tell, tell us what you think. Hey, Jonathan, before you switch to the next slide, just had a question I thought probably I should put out to everybody. The question was whether the pipes part of the software was in the yeah. tabs. And the answer at this stage is no, not in this release. It's just restricted or contained to the the surfaces and the road section, but um, there is hopefully plans to, to port it across. But no, at the moment, the pipe stuff will still have to be accessed through the ribbon. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Yeah, I had that as a note to, uh, to ah, mention cool. at some point. Oh, no, just, you, you, it's perfect. I, 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 yeah, I already had a Q&A about it. I answered the question, but I thought it'd be nice to um, let everybody know. Yeah, no, look, the, the great thing about tool space is that we'll be able to add in extra tabs. So if there's something related to survey later on down the line or there's something related to pipes later on down the line, then um, those tabs give us that flexibility to, to build on the tool space without it becoming um, the, the issue, same issue that we've got really with the ribbon, which is we're just trying to pack more and more things into the ribbon. To give you an idea, if I flick back a slide here, guys, the subgrade editor or subgrade model manager, which is a huge piece of kit, but it's fantastic. It lets you build subgrade models of any model, including model builder models in civil site design. That is currently sitting, I think for most people, under the auto model pull down um, on the roads tab. So it, you add new functionality. It's like, where can we put it? But you can put it in, but then people can't find it or don't see it. And that for me is one of the benefits of tool space is going to expose a lot more existing functionality that you may not be aware of in the software. So. Um, that's the first thing we're going to cover. The second thing, these are sort of smaller improvements or smaller new features, I would say. But the, the, the main one um, that got added in for templates was um, packing, which essentially means you can create a little zip file or bundle of your templates in your project and then share them um, to other jobs um, or share them between colleagues or then save them as little uh, little bundles that you can then say, well, look, these are this particular uh, local authorities templates. We'll have those saved and then import them and share them around rather than necessarily having them all in one giant common folder, um, which can be extremely helpful. There has been some interface changes as well, namely the color changes um, to the actual uh, template editor as well, which we'll talk about very, very briefly. The um, Big one that's happened, well, two uh, big features that have gone into uh, Model Viewer. First one, surface analysis. And um, for those that are, that are outside, um, particularly things like the UK, um, this would be called isopachites. Um, but, but essentially, it's coloring, coloring height ranges. Um, Civil 3D users will be familiar with this through the analysis of um, surface properties in Civil 3D. Um, but we can now do the same on any surface, including Civil 3D surfaces in Model Viewer. So this is actually a Civil 3D surface you're looking at here. And the uh, whoops, the road um, is obviously uh, a civil side design road model, but you can apply it to any surface. With that, and I haven't got the preview for it, we've also got slope uh, or profile coloring, which will apply. Um, it's probably really difficult to explain without a screenshot. It'll apply coloring to your road string profiles to determine uh, grades. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll explore that in more detail when I can actually physically show you rather than talk it through with you on, a, uh, on an empty screenshot. The uh, the other second part of the model viewer is uh, the, the inclusion of catchment analysis. So it says you've got three parts. So it's not specifically catchment analysis. Um, it'll do three things, ponding analysis, catchment, and low points. And uh, we're going to explore that in respect of a, a little car park we've got and then use the low points on an intersection, probably somewhere over on the uh, on the road over here, um, just to show you how that uh, how that works. But that's a neat little feature, which hopefully, hopefully gets you into Model Viewer. Again, Model Viewer is one of those features where there is tons of stuff you can do in here. Um, and if you don't access it regularly, you may not know, but this is a really good feature that we've added in. Lastly, and this is actually one of my favorites, this was in the BritsCAD release for V23.1, but it wasn't quite the version that you're gonna look at today. Um, it, it's essentially taking 2D objects, such as text, uh, single line text, multi-line text, blocks and points, and then converting those from zero elevations, which let's face it, we all get, we all get historic surveys or surveys that have got no 3D data at all, 
and then creating civil site design COGO points that have elevations from which we can create a surface. And for me, this is a big, big time saver. Um, having done so much of this over the years, LISP routines 15, 20 years ago to do all of this. Um, and this is an excellent feature to uh, very quickly go through and do a number of different things, even with block attributes, reading them and then creating 3D data from it. So we'll show you that one at the end. So let's get started. Um, we're going to be jumping, as I've um, sort of highlighted on the first slide, Civil 3D. But quite frankly, if you're using the AutoCAD Britscare version, other than the interface that you're looking at here, everything will be the same. So if you haven't um, loaded up V20. In fact, that's what I wanted to do. Can we just very quickly, Todd, if everyone's got their hands lowered, can we just raise your hand if you have downloaded and installed Civil Site Design V24? Just raise your hand. No, oh, hands are going up. They are. We are. We're up to uh, a few. Yeah, okay. If you don't know where the raise hand icon is, it doesn't matter, but uh, you should hopefully see a little control. Uh, it looks like we're around eight, nine, ten. So okay, uh, small, 10, small percentage. So small proportion. So fantastic. Well, it's good to know. Um, I guess the other question would be if we can lower the hands. Oh, okay. um, I can do that. Thank you, Todd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, but were was anybody waiting to watch this webinar before they downloaded it? If you can raise your hand, if that was the case. Yeah, a couple of hands going up. A couple of yep. hands, okay. Yeah, All right, yeah, so the rest of you... A lot more hands are going up. Yeah, so... Oh, it's... wow. Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're shooting up. up. Yeah, brilliant. So people are probably wanting to know what it is before they install it. Which I get. No, I totally makes, get that. Makes 100% sense. It does, it does. Thank you, everyone, for raising your hand on that. Uh, so, yeah, the, at the end of the day, this is um, uh, more of an overview. Um, there are some more detailed videos, which I'll show you in a second, conveniently through the tool space. Um, which explain um, how these functions work. But look, Toolspace is, is really the main one. And if you uh, have installed the software, you're looking for this Toolspace panel. And if for whatever reason this panel is in the wrong place, much like anything in AutoCAD and Civil 3D, you can simply drag this panel to the right spot where you'll find it here and then simply fire it up. Now, when you fired it up, it's expecting there to be a data folder with the drawing. So you can't fire it up unless you have the drawing at least saved. OK, if you've saved the drawing, a data folder will get created when you fire up um, the tool space. So I've actually got the Q&A panel everything to my right hand side in the way of my uh, my my planned plan of attack here. So I'm just going to move that out of the way. The, the idea is that, again, familiar territory. This is a dockable palette, which I'm simply going to be moving around, as you can see here. And then we can just reposition wherever we want in our environment. Now, the way that we've done most videos and, and training so far is we always have it plonked on the right hand side. So I'm simply going to go anchor right, then hover over here and unhide. And this is how I like to have it set up. At the end of the day, first and foremost, it's an aggregator of civil site design content. So this is telling me everything that's in my job from templates that are being used, you can even see the little green tick, and we'll talk about that hover in a minute, to every single alignment that is in this project, Civil 3D or Civil Site Design, and if they're in use, and then the road strings, network strings, you name it, it's all crammed in here. But as you can see, when I say cram, that's possibly the worst word I could have used. It's not crammed, it's neatly segregated, so you can quickly go and find the content. The first thing I'm gonna show you is the drawing name at the top, when you right click on that, you're actually provided with a list of sort of go-to commands for uh, sort of general usage of civil site design. Now, drawing settings would be your active settings. We've got things like civil 3D styles. So if you're not familiar with, I suppose this is a key difference for the BricsCAD or CAD users, you won't see that one. Um, this is actually controlling your civil 3D profiles and corridor output if you wanted to use that. Tool space settings is the one I wanna very briefly highlight because this is a new feature which you would not have seen whilst the others are existing features. Loading the tool space whenever you um, open up a civil site design project, again, entirely optional. We did briefly see a thumbnail of the template and the template delay, i.e. how long I hover before I see that thumbnail, and then how long I hover before that thumbnail then disappears, is controlled through these numbers here. And we'll see those numbers in action, as it were, um, very shortly when we go back to the templates. Object highlighting for me is just brilliant because now I can actually see if you, I mean, for some of you, you've probably got, you know, 20, 30 curb returns on a job or multiple grading strings or driveways along, you know, several, uh, several kilometers of road. Just being able to now highlight the object or the string, particularly within the view, just through this space is, is just, is, is just for me, it's a big game changer. 
Um, rebuilding models on refresh is essentially saying, look, if I press this button here, not only will it refresh the content in here, because bear in mind, it's reading, for example, civil 3D alignments. So if you add or change a civil 3D alignment, refreshing this will refresh and update everything in this list and rebuild your models, which you can choose to turn on or off. Or you can run a thread. OK, so you can say when I click this button, run a thread which we can see here. These are some of my um, uh, default threads that I've got. Maybe I want to go and update my parking bay when I click this button on this particular job. So don't be too concerned about having to run threads because the great thing is you should see very shortly, we have all our threads listed here and we can just double click on them in, in, uh, in tool space. So it's, an, it's really kind of neither here nor there, but it's a great way of basically being able to customize your refresh button. So in respect of what's actually in here, now we could spend a whole ton of time talking about what's in here but really if you're familiar with civil site design you know what all of these con all of these particular features are templates really for me is is a big one because getting finding templates seeing them and seeing what's being applied in the job has always been an issue whereas it's not anymore because i can now see all of the templates in my template library there's that hover by the way so i'm going to keep my mouse in its same position here and it just disappears um I can actually see a green tick and that green tick tells me that the template is in use within the product project. So if I right click on Islet Street, I can go edit template. And as I do that, I'm sent straight to that template. And we'll talk about the coloring and other bits and pieces in here very shortly, but the, the focus at the moment is tool space. So as far as accessing in templates goes, this requires no more explanation. OK, you can change those hover values. Um, to um, to whatever value you want. Alignments, this, this, this is fantastic. So at the moment, what this is doing is reading all of my civil 3D alignments. And because grading strings in civil site design actually create or turn your polyline into a civil site design alignment, for those of you that in civil 3D didn't know that, um, it actually becomes an alignment. And these are all the alignments that are being used throughout my job. Okay. Now, row one is down here. Um, you can see that I'm able to go ahead and create road profile in fact, we're going to do the same with the Princess Highway. As you can see, I'm hovering, by the way. Look at the hover graph, uh, the, the object highlighting as I'm doing this. So I've go, go to road one, middle of the job there, road two. This is, for me, just, just great to being able to review a project, including the Zoom 2. OK, the danger with this webinar was like, how am I going to do this without sort of jumping all over the place? So I'm going to try and make sure I don't jump all, all over the place, see something I'm excited about, and then just show you guys out of context or everything else. So that's your alignments. And as I said, refreshing will refresh the list of alignments in the project, particularly if you've gone through and changed something in Civil 3D. Road strings, um, when we come in here and right click on road strings, we get a plethora of different commands related purely to string creation, creating edit, 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 create editing a road, the vertical grading editor, et cetera. And there are also commands in here which you may not know about. And I've deliberately done on one of the videos just highlighted something called multi-string edit. So multi-string edit will let me go through. Um, and this was found, I think, on the design. No, it's found under resample sections. Maybe somewhere you don't go very often. Um, this basically is a command which will let you go and resample to a different surface and change the spacing and template of multiple strings in your project in, an, uh, in one hit. Really, really good little um, feature. Want to know more about it? click the little video button here, which will give you a video about how that feature works. So not only are you getting tools related to um, that particular um, feature, for example, let's just right click on row one here. Um, you'll actually be getting, sorry, go back here. You'll actually be getting other features and controls and functions, which maybe you weren't aware of. A lot of Civil 3D uh, stuff in here for the Civil 3D users as well. So it's all at your fingertips. Um, the same goes with editing the string. Right click, open up um, this Islet Street um, Road string, right click, vertical grading editor. Want to edit it, right, design data, design data form. Um, and then I just want to go through and maybe change some variations, et cetera. So it's all there, meaning that I even just opening up a cross section window takes half the time. Wow, that's a lot of subgrade. <laughs> I uh, probably should have checked this before um, uh, before pr presenting this in this particular. I think I've been using this for what we call subgrade variations, um, which uh, allow you to go through and uh, vary the subgrade, which is why I think that subgrade's got uh, so much going on with it. Um, let's continue on and pretend that didn't happen. I'll get, get rid of that in the edit. Um, one thing we've got in here, and I probably should have highlighted when it came to the alignments, is parent. And yes, I did skip it. 
parametric alignments. So these are our, your alignments that are for network strings. So we, we deliberately don't, if you can imagine having all of those in one big list with your um, main alignments, it would get pretty cumbersome. So what we've done is we've separated them out so that you've got parametric alignments. Uh, and essentially these are derived from or created with your um, your curb return strings here. Or as you can see there, the cul-de-sac. So even just getting to your cul-de-sac, editing, edit cul-de-sac, off we go. Okay, so there's no clicking involved on screen. I think really most of you will be getting the general idea here as to how this is working because we've got profile strings, grading strings, just being able to edit the grading string straight off the bat. Grading strings for me is the big one because I know that for some of you, you've got tons of them in a job, literally just, you know, tens and tens and tens of them and just navigating them through in the normal edit string form. And just trying to find the one that you're after can be very, very difficult. So having them in here is a big game changer. I keep saying that word, but it, it, as far as I'm concerned, it really is, including things like the surface. So the surfaces, again, we decided that rather than just punching all of the surfaces into a CSD services list, we would actually segregate them based on their prefix. So we will have noticed over the years that we've begun to prefix our surfaces like surface extend surfaces with SE or built models have got BM, um, road string surfaces or string surfaces begin with ARD, or um, basically they're all gonna get put into little pots. So as we go through and create different surfaces, they get put into these pots. So again, you're not having to go through scouring them, um, trying to find a particular one. Again, right clicking yields a whole load of content in respect of things like model viewer, rebuilding, surface manager, toggle display, then right clicking on the surface itself, maybe we'd like to run the water drop. So if you have been using grips uh, within uh, civil site design, you can still do that, but also you may find that it's just easier to run uh, some of these toggling commands through here. A couple of other things, um, models. So any model that, you, that is created by civil site design, be it um, a built model or a surface extend or subgrade model, um, they all get listed in here, meaning that we can right click, access things like model builder, surface extend models, or we can actually go and directly edit the model, as I'm going to do here, and open up the model builder model um, straight from the um, straight from the tool space, which is what I'm going to now just close down. Same goes with subgrade models and corridor models. Now here a cough, is there a question on its way, Todd? Uh, yeah, there was actually, it was a question about the um, section data form. Can you access that from, from the um, string, the road string? So if you right click on Islet Street, can you get to the section data form? Resample sections. No, the section, not the design data form, the section data form. Ah, oh, I see what you mean. Um, no, not as yet. Because I, no. think, because I didn't think so. I just needed you to check because I didn't have, yeah, yeah you got to do it right the cross section window. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But interesting question. And I know that the um, the development team will be uh, be keeping an ear to this webinar. So any feedback that we get um, will, be, will be well received. And don't forget, don't forget, guys, tool space feedback survey down there okay so have a play if you've got a comment immediately great just hold it and then once you've had a really good play go ahead and do the feedback survey because at the end of the day this will be built and the interface will continue to change from civil site design based on customer feedback that's how we drive the changes within the software and the, and the new features so um there's our threads we can very quickly just double click. I'm not going to uh, run this now, but we can double click on a thread to run it directly from uh, the list here. So there's a whole ton of information in this job and all of it can be seen and by and large edited minus the section data form um, through this one interface. So I was going to create another road, um, Princess Highway. I think for time, um, I don't think I'll go there just yet because I've got other things to show you. Down the bottom, we've kind of got some staples. So these are not necessarily project related, um, but they are more just sort of generic tools and functions such as project assist. Left clicking on the button yields a selection of tools such as toggle display, CAD output, drawing cleanup. We've got a selection of Kogo point tools, which some of, some of you may be beginning to operate with, particularly if you've seen some of the, the lock grading stuff. This is the main one we'll be looking at a little bit later, which is convert objects to Kogo. And then we've got things like the Excel report. Um, I was chatting with a customer yesterday who wanted to export the IPs from a string. Um, I think they are in the webinar right now, actually. Um, they wanted to export the IPs from a string um, to an Excel spreadsheet. So an IP with the, uh, the elevation and the chainage, where well, you can use the Excel report to do that. And if you have a look on our V23.1 playlist, 
in the uh, on the YouTube channel. You'll see an extensive video which explains how that works. You can actually export content, edit that content in Excel, and then import it back and edit your string using an Excel spreadsheet. So a lot of stuff you can do with that. Volumes, labels, output, um, and unfortunately, just due to the way that my screen is um, set up, this button is actually appearing on my right <laughs> to my right hand side. I will give you an explanation. It says plot long section, cross section, batch plot to file. Again, if you didn't know, that one was kind of hiding on the general tab. So it'll actually batch plot all your layout tabs to a PDF or PDFs. Multi set out is there. Yay, I hear you cry. And slope patterns and scale and layout settings. So there's, again, features which you probably didn't know about um, uh, or did know about, but find them frustrating to access are all plugged into here. And lastly, we've got our good friend Model Viewer. And this is a staple part of operating civil site design. So as far as we're concerned, that's where it needs to be rather than ne necessarily under a right click. It's there for you to go ahead and have a play. So um, let's just quickly show you, I will just quickly show you how we can go ahead and create a road string on here. Just the, the, the way in which we anticipate people doing this through um, uh, the, uh, the tool space. So I know that I've got an alignment called, excuse me, right clicking there, Princess Highway. I'm seeing it highlighted in the drawing. It's this one down here. I'm going to right click on Princess Highway, go create road. And then I decide, well, look, my template needs to be my rural. I'm going to leave the spacings as they are and click OK. And then, yep, OK, there's the, uh, the usual generic design that the software applies. And then I decide, well, look, I need to see that in road strings. Um, there it is, Princess Highway. I now want to go and change something in the design data. And then I can go through the design data form, make any edits that I wish to make. And then maybe, just maybe, in fact, let's just try this. We'll open up the vertical grading editor, go to the model tab and create a string surface. Okay, so for those of you that don't know what this is, this is a surface just of this string only, which is dynamic and does update. If you didn't see it, there's some little green contours down there. Now this is actually the what we prefix with ARD. This is a little string surface. Now, if we come down here, we can't see it in our surfaces. It's not listed there at all. Let's hit refresh. When we do that, what we should find is that the software is now going to show us. There we go. It's actually run a bear in mind when we click refresh, it's rebuilding the model at the same time, which is why there was a bit of delay there because it's quite a lot to rebuild, which is why the customization of that button may be appropriate for you. Okay. Let's just file down here. Here we go. Road, road surface. So any ARD surface will be found in here from which I can then decide, well, I'm going to turn on the, um, turn on the triangles for that. And I think just due to the fact that this is the draw order, having a wonderful time, we'll go and turn on the triangles and do a regen. And there we go. So the, you can really get a sense of just the, the feel of running through tool space, not having to come up to the ribbon virtually at all. There will be a little bit of transitioning, I expect, as I had the same, uh, had the same thing where I was sort of transitioning off, weaning myself off the ribbon, instinctively going up there for commands and sort of coming through here. I've got a couple of curb returns I can just pop in here and here. So I'm going to pop to the network strings. Uh, right click on uh, network strings because I'm not editing curb returns or creating specific ones. I'm just going to run auto and just say, look, any intersections without a curb return, just pop a 10 meter curb return in for me, which is what it's doing down here. It's not particularly uh, pretty, but I now have a couple of curb returns being added in uh, where I want them. So that is really a, a very brief, but I'm hoping fairly concise overview of, of tool space. Todd, are there any sort of other questions um, in respect of what we're doing here before I move on to the templates? Uh, there are a couple of questions, but not related to the tool space. There's one about the point conversion from 2D to 3D. Yeah, we'll cover that. But I thought I'd end. wait. I yeah. said it, we'd answer that later. Mm -hmm. There's another one about IFC volumes, which is not really related to anything we're doing now. So no, no. I do have an answer for that as well. Um, oh, cool. Even, well, then I'll yeah. ask that one later. Yeah. Okay. End. Well, I can, yeah. Can cool. I, yeah. Well, I, um, yeah, it's not relevant right now. We'll That's talk not. about that a little bit later. Yeah, yeah I figured I was going to wait until you got to model. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> Marvellous. Okay, well, look, um, so I'm going to op predominantly operate with the Toolspace open and run with Toolspace for the rest of this um, rest of this webinar. So the next thing we're going to have a look at is the template. So it's kind of an improvement. Um, if we right click on the template editor rather than right clicking on a specific template. Ah, before I forget, I knew I had something to mention here. If you are hovering over a template, and there is no preview or no thumbnail, it's, it's simply due to the fact that the template needs to have been opened and displayed 
simply displayed in the template editor. That's what generates the thumbnail. All right. So if you're hovering, you're going, well, I can't see a single thumbnail here for any of these. Open up your template editor, like I'm going to do now, through the tool space. And really, all you need to do is cycle through your templates. Um, I am running a slightly different version to the commercial release, uh, which is why it's jumping local, public, local, public. Um, but you'll find on the commercial release, you do not get this. The display coloring. In fact, let's just find a template, which would be half decent, shall we? Um, let's just go and pick road six meter. The display coloring here, oh my goodness, that subgrade is atrocious. Anyway, um, we'll pop to the display button here. This was um, just, uh, uh, we, we, we went ahead and just sort of changed the background color on the template editor to a sort of this charcoal color, not realizing necessarily how that would impact people um, who aren't that great with contrast. And that does affect many people. So rather than just simply change it back to black, we said, well, look, let you, we'll let you change different components. So you can see here with the curb, I can just go in and say, well, actually, I'd like that to be um, like that to be green, please, and apply. And you can have that only in the template editor. OK, this doesn't uh, transfer over anywhere else. Um, it's only within the template editor. You can also change things like the text size and whatnot. So just a few controls. The big one would really be the packing. Um, template packing. So in this particular job, I've got three or four different templates that I'd like to pass over to another project. And historically, that's been a complete nightmare, I would say, because you've got to go template options, copy to global, copy to global, copy to global, and then open the other job and then copy to local, copy to local. And it's, it's um, yeah, painful. Now, all we're going to do is go export. And I've got a temporary library folder here. And I'm going to go, um, uh, go to webinar. And we'll call basically save it. Now it, it's not um, going to. We notice how we didn't pick any templates, and the reason why, if I click OK here, is because it does just grab every single template. All right. So there is a caveat here. It's not going to simply just go and cherry pick the ones that we want. This is where we cherry pick the ones that we want. So we're going to go up to the. See how I went to the ribbon. Just, to, just slap my wrist. Um, let's just go template editor. That's instinct. Um, and those templates we want, if we go import template pack, are these ones begin with Islet Street. Okay. Now, what you can do is hold the shift key, select all, and go toggle off, toggle on. Okay. Then hit the shift key, select the ones you want, select toggle on. Okay. And import. If there is a template already in your template editor which has exactly the same name, it will not get overwritten. Okay, so we only bring in new, newly named templates, meaning that when I go to my template editor, I now have those four templates being added in. There is a new note, by the way, um, about the through code not being EB. So if you want to use a particular template for a road, um, what you'll find is that that little note will keep appearing until you um, find a template that has actually, <laughs> if I can find one, uh, here we go, Old Faithful here, road six meter. Um, you notice EB is on there. Um, so some people, uh, particularly new users, uh, habitually go in and, and pick a template that doesn't have the through code EB from your active settings. And uh, what we found is that obviously they can't then create an intersection. They can't create uh, curb returns. So um, we put that note on there just as a little guide to say, if you want to use this in an intersection, then it needs the through code EB. Okie dokie. Right. Well, look, moving on from templates, let's jump into model viewer. Um, and you'll see that those templates have now appeared up here um, on, the, uh, on the transferred uh, drawing uh, data set that we've got. I'm going to jump back to Civil Site Design V24 which is this data set I had here. And then we're going to fire up model viewer. So I'm not going to make it full screen because there are some forms which pop up and I'm going to be required to jump into the drawing at some point. Now, for those of you that have got um, sunglasses on, um, you're going to need them. Or if you haven't, you're going to need them because obviously I've gone full Technicolor with uh, the surface analysis here. Um, so what I've done is just applied some. Um, and then I can talk about it rather than sort of apply it from scratch, which, to be honest with you, doesn't take very long anyway. What we'll do is we'll just make this a little bit bigger. So I've got surface analysis applied to the natural here, uh, natural NS combined, which is a civil 3D surface. And then I've got profile analysis, um, which is showing me um, uh, the different slopes of my road string in different colors, uh, different colored ranges. And then if you look closely, um, in fact, what we might do here is just quickly t toggle off the display of contours by going to um, the contours tab, just to give it a little bit of clarity. You can actually see there are, wherever we have sample lines uh, for our string, there are colored lines to indicate slopes. 
OK, and the red at the moment indicates that we are uh, on the excessive end of our slope range, which I'll show you how to set. So that, where, does, where does this basically come from? Well, if we head to toggle display and model viewer, model viewer now has under the um, uh, style that you can apply to a base surface, OK, or I should stress a design surface could be either the option to now at, uh, provide surface analysis. Now, don't click the pencil icon because that'll send you them into the material um, group setup. You need to come up to the analysis tab here. When you're in here, every surface that you have present in your project is listed and you can go through and set up analysis depending on what surface you're interested in. So here's the one that we've edited and it's edited because and, uh, we know it's edited because it's been highlighted in blue, which is kind of a nice handy little tip. We click on the three dots. For those of you that have used, you know, Surface Manager and um, or, or even the uh, the analysis, surface analysis in uh, Civil 3D, this should be familiar. So what we've got is a color scheme. Um, so what we're going to do is click on the little pencil icon. There's a few in there. And in here, it's very simple. We've simply got a start color and an end color. OK, and in within the range. So 20 percent, 40 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent. Think of those as percentages. We want this particular color to be displayed, OK, which is what you're actually seeing in the background. But you can see here that you can simply have just one range. Start at white, end at blue. OK, and I'd like you to transition with the increment that I'm or range that I'm going to specify shortly. So very, very simple and straightforward setup for setting up your own color scheme. All you need to do is simply click and produce the color. Then once you've done that, you can then specify the range on which you'd like to see this analysis. So at the moment, I'm saying, well, I'd like to see the analysis between uh, the bottom elevation and the top elevation of this surface, which is automatically applied, by the way. And then you can determine the range. So it, I've got two ways I can do this. I can split the surface up into eight bands of color, which you can see is now doing here. So I'm now getting this arrangement. If I click OK, this should reduce the amount of coloring that's going on in here, which it does. Let's just pop back to toggle display and then pop back to the analysis tab. Or, and by the way, I should I should sort of say some, some of this might get look like it gets reset. OK, so the number of ranges in here or value increment. Uh, this is the first pass of this this particular tool. So um, there may be further improvements to it later on. But some of the content you may find uh, it gets um, sort of reset. The value increment means break this up into values of one, which for me means every meter provide a different color, um, which, as you can imagine, is going to generate a lot more coloring um, to, to our surface. But you may find that that's applicable on some vastly or very slight ranging surfaces, but it's very, very straightforward, okay, how this works. The same principle can be applied to the vertical profile, which is what I've got going on here. So let's just go up to the TOG display again, analysis, and you can see this is only applied to road strings. So if you have profile strings, grading strings, the, or network strings, this is not applied, okay? We go set up analysis, and what we'd like to do is we're going to use land because it's got a nice broad range of colors um, in different states between 0% and 15%. This is a longitudinal grade. So if we're outside of this range, you won't see anything. Use a value increment of one, i.e. for every percent, use a different color. All right. So I'm blue. When I'm getting to around the 10%, I'm yellow. When I'm getting very steep, I'm at 14. So you can obviously flex these values around if you want and adjust them. We're going to click apply. We won't see any change, mainly because of the fact that um, this was being applied already. But if we have a look over here where it's gone, uh, where we've got, well, in fact, we can have a look over here where it's gone white. White would normally indicate that we're outside those uh, those ranges, but we've got red and yellow. Right in model viewer, you can right click or just to get into the habit. Um, we've got row three up here. I mean, to be honest with you, by the time I've done this, I should have just right clicked in model viewer, right click, vertical grading editor. Here we go. So you can see here we're in these, we're well outside that slope range. We're at 32 percent here, but we're around the 13 percent here and the 10 percent where I mentioned yellow before, which is why we've got those colors. So that can be a very helpful little feature um, uh, to use and just have generically applied across your job. The same tool is then used for the cross sections. So I'm going to head down here and go back to toggle display and then go on to the uh, analysis tab, set up cross section again, only on road strings, and you get the same uh, same uh, thing applied. Between 0% and 15%, value increment of one, 
compute ranges. So if I've got anything of a slope that's from zero to 1%, it will be blue. And if I'm down to 14%, it will be red. Okay, so again, same type of thing being applied. And you can see here, um, it's not going to change just for speed. But if I right click here and go display cross section, I'm at that uh, one in, well, well, yeah, very steep. I'm one in seven. Okay, so I'm extremely steep on that side. Um, question will be steep question really steep on that side which is why it's gone it's it's showing up as that red cross section and if there is um if you're outside as you can see outside of the range that you've done on the surface analysis um then you obviously will not get any line appear whatsoever okay so that's the surface analysis now what we're going to focus on is the catchment uh, analysis so we've got uh, three hey, different please Sorry. yeah no, there's I a question relevant to the surface analysis i thought it'd be worth answering questions whether the um Colors can be exported out to CAD from the surface analysis in Model Viewer. I, not, not to my knowledge. I didn't I see it. I have a feeling if we export a DWG. You get um, it out? I'm going to just test it. Maybe this is... Because this otherwise it'd be you just do the surface analysis in the, the, the surface engine and do it that way. Yeah, um, which I would, ex I would expect. Now, let, let me just try this. Um, Sorry to interrupt. I thought sort of no, no, no. relevant it's, it's to the, really good, the question. Hundred percent. It's a really good question. Uh, what we might do is just see and open this drawing up. So, I think for those of you that didn't know, that again, another part of um, uh, this software is that you or you can export us multiple different features. Let's just try this. And just give it a second to initialize, which is what it's doing right now. And it's okay. Okay, so no. Uh, the answer is no. Yeah. So we've. Oh well, look. It has. It ha interestingly, it's brought the cross section uh, content across, um, but not the surface one. Not the surface. No. So, um, but look, that's something that um, I'm sure that we'll look at uh, in the future um, as part of this to ensure that you can get that sort of mapping uh, applied. But yeah, thank excellent you. question. No, thank you. Thank you. All right. Whoops. Now jumping in. Totally the wrong job. Just, uh, obviously, I'm initializing each drawing as I'm opening them up, so just give it a few seconds to 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 get started. All right. Yeah, so I'll close model viewer. That's fine. So we'll fire it back up and have a quick look at the uh, the analysis. So we've got ponding analysis and we've got catchment and the low point. So we're going to use this little car park as an example. Right. So first of all, Pop to the analysis tab, and then we go catchment analysis. And then in here, we then pick our surface. Now I'm using a built model surface for my car park here, which just includes two strings, the island in the middle, and then we've got the outer edge, okay? First of all, we've got the spacing side. Now, all that's going to happen here is that a DEM, basically a gridded surface, will be created for the analysis. All right, so think of this as the grid size or, uh, for the cell spacing. So if you're using this on a very, very big job, like a, if I was using this on the NS, I'd probably leave that at 10, okay? Process the surface. You can see that that was incredibly quick. And what we've ended up with is um, a grid size relatively small. So what I'm gonna do is punch that number down to five, process, and it's still small. And I'm gonna just bring that down until the processing time is acceptable to me, okay? Which it is there. The, you may find that with certain surfaces, that as soon as you bring that down, the processing time takes a little bit longer, okay? And this is one of those tools which you will, once you've closed it down, you have to reprocess to, to start again, but that just assumes that you may have made changes to your design. So let's just show you what it does first, and I'll explain uh, as best I can um, what's going on in the background. So you can see here, we've actually got this sort of low point going on here. And we'll run the ponding analysis first. So the way it works is you check the option you want. Once you've processed, click calculate. You'll then be prompted to left click on your model within the drawing. Okay, so I'm gonna left click simply in this area here. And then what's happening is the software, as you can see there, it's all that's happening is that it's trying to um, basically review cells that are higher than the specified discharge point, which we've negotiated, we've basically said is here, and don't allow water to flow, okay? So these are called ponding cells. Let's just have another example here. We'll click on calculate, and we'll click down in this corner here. So essentially, as I said, is looking at areas that are higher than that particular spot and not allowing the water to flow out, which is why it's essentially saying water would be trapped 
within this area here. There's no kind of flow times, um, storm durations involved. It's a fairly sort of, I'd say, fairly generic calculation that goes on in the background. It is a proper calculation that's happening in the background. Um, but the, the intention with this is that it just gives you a broad feel as to where water would pond on a surface. And we can use the same one on an intersection in a second. The same goes with the catchment. And by the way, you can actually see the grid. So that's the cell spacing size of 0.5. So the smaller the number, the more detail you're going to get. Now, we can't output this to CAD just due to the way in which it's being calculated. But with the catchment, we can. So if I click on catchment, click calculate, click OK, and then left click again in this same corner, the software will go ahead and basically it searches all these neighboring cells to determine the catchment region and compares all the elevations. And it stops at a cell when the neighboring cell, um, or it stops, sorry, um, when the neighboring cell is at a lower elevation. So this is basically how it's trying to establish this particular catchment area. Now, one thing you can do with this is output to CAD, which, you know, could be, by and large, could be fairly helpful. Whilst the model isn't perfect, if I output to CAD, it will pr basically prompt us to go and pick a layer, which in this case will be layer zero. Bad, bad layer control. Click OK. And then what we should get in the background, and I might just have to left click in the drawing net. There we go. So it will do its best. The reason why it, it's not perfect is just due to the density and the detail around the, the cell spacing. If you've got cell spacing, which is at point one, try to draw a polyline around all of those individual cells is incredibly difficult from a technology perspective, but also very time consuming. So we'll do our best to provide you with a rough polyline outline, which for me is better than absolutely nothing, because this is really important that I do get this applied in the, um, in the model in some respect. So the same goes with, if we head over to, this is, um, this is a known low point. OK, this intersection, you can actually see there's a low point here, low point here and a low point here. Um, I'm going to run the ponding analysis. And in fact, in model viewer, head out over to here. And what I might do is, oh, no, I'll leave it on. We'll go ponding analysis, calculate, click OK. And what we should do, first of all, completely forgot to change the model. What I'm not going to do is leave the cell spacing as 0.5 because this is where it's actually quite big. So I'm going to make that 10 process the surface, which you can see actually took a little bit longer. We'll make that six process. So it's processing there. It's finished. Ponding analysis, calculate, click OK, and then we're going to left click. And in this case, I'm actually going to left click on this spot here, just on the uh, on the, uh, the lip of the gutter there. Due to the cell spacing, which you can actually see is kind of quite large here, um, it's trying to, in, it's sort of semi indicating to us that we're going to get ponding sort of towards this part of the design, but clearly it's in the intersection. I'm not a big fan of this, actually, this, uh, this cell spacing number. Let me just try one. Give that a few seconds. Obviously, if you're using this um, on your own desktop, whatever, you're not going to mind the processing time, but when you're sitting there watching me do it, um, you're sort of twiddling your thumbs, man presses buttons on computer whilst I'm watching. There we go, it did it. Um, calculate. Click OK, and let's go ahead and click in here. And that should go ahead and then run its calculation in the background. Really, this is sort of designed for smaller areas. You don't really want to be using this and applying this on very large. In fact, this is now analyzing the entirety of my road model, which um, maybe wasn't the best thing to do. But ideally, you're running this through on sort of small parts of design. There we go. Yeah, so it's ponding in this area. And also, it's ponding in here and here. And that will become apparent. You can actually see it. it's done the whole job. There's ponding going on down here as well. It's analyzing the whole model. Um, and that's correct because there is a big low point in the, uh, in the design there. So it's a really helpful tool to get you in that ballpark in combination with fine low points. Now, um, it again, relies on a cell spacing, but buffer size has appeared. And I'll explain what this, what this does when we click on calculate. probably should have done the cell spacing a little bit bigger because we're going to end up with the same time. So there we go. Right. So this is what it's trying to do is pick up every sort of low point it can possibly find within the design. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's overkill. Obviously, there aren't low points all around here, but it's deemed that the area is so flat that there's a chance that there's going to be a low point in this area. And I know that there is a low point here and I know there is one here and here. So how do I change this? Well, the buffer size is what's going to help you. OK, so the buffer size can be increased um, because at the moment that number is saying, look, search fairly often. And again, it's a variable which is different on job to job, which is why we can't give you a recommended number. So I'm going to type three, maybe make the cell spacing on here four. process the surface. 
and then just run, if that's already happened, run calculate. None at all. Okay, let's put that back to two. Calculate. And it's actually only picked up the one in that area. And this is where these variables become fairly important. So the cell spacing for this area should be small. Okay, because there's no point in having a cell spacing of four, I would say. Let's put that back to one, process the surface. And I'm actually going to just keep the buffer size, um, I crank that up a little bit. So it's a very kind of flexible tool. You do need to go in and adjust it on a model by model basis, as you can see here. Um, there's no point me coming in here, picking numbers and then moving on to the next thing. Really have to highlight what this is doing. Um, let's put that number to three, calculate. So the grid is determined, the cell spacing is the area and how dense it should it should create this DEM surface. Then the buffer size is how often should it look to apply the low point marker. Um, the smaller the number, the more it will apply low point markers. See, that's that's a bit more reasonable. Yeah, a bit more reasonable. OK, but it's meant to be, again, an, a marker for you to see where there are potential low points on your job. I know for a fact that there are some on this curve return because of the way that they've been um, designed or not. And I know that there's a low point here. And you can see as we go around, we've got low points being marked. The big thing with this is that, and again, I, I had this question when we when this uh, was developed is, well, how do we get this into CAD? And the, the development team have uh, created a little um, tool here to generate these as COGO points, civil site design COGO points in the drawing. When you run this, there's no need to understand how COGO points work. I appreciate that we might be getting to a world of where people are going, well, I, I need to understand these. Um, you don't. Um, all that you need to do is go and pick any one of these three code sets. This is really down to how these are coded up and it's not really important. Design code set, click on select. The code point name can be important. What we'll just go is LP. It's gonna put it into a point group. All right. Again, you don't need to understand point groups. You don't need to understand Kogo points, but by calling it LP means that it won't get, uh, we won't have a surface created or anything like that. We're going to click OK. We did get a surface created. <laughs> OK, conveniently, we're going to talk about why that happens in a minute anyway. We're going to go close. But what you'll find is that we get these little Kogo points being generated on screen, which are grip editable. But if you want to get rid of them, Okay, you can see the elevation. There's the contours. There's the kind of validation that we did get these low points uh, picked up correctly. If you want to get rid of them, left click, delete them. Okay. Now the surface that's being created in the background there is actually appearing in Surface Manager, and it kind of segues us neatly um, onto um, uh, what's going on with Kogo points under CSD surfaces. Any Kogo points that go into creating a surface actually get put in their own surface here, survey surface. All right, um, and we're gonna just explain very shortly when we do the 2D objects, where that comes from and how they get created. So that's the catchment analysis and surface analysis. Now we're gonna look at the last um, little thing here and you can see here this, um, this surface here is all over the shop. So we're gonna toggle contours off. It's there, we're just not seeing it. Okay, and that's absolutely fine. The last thing we're gonna look at is the 2D objects. So 2D objects, converting them to some kind of 3D object which we can create a surface from. So this job um, I've had kicking around for a long time um, and in there are 3D lines which um, are delineating or sort of um, stringing strung between points but those points are actually 2D and we've got some 3D faces. The rest of this 2D okay got no information to use here whatsoever. So the great thing is this new feature we've got uh, well sort of existing feature for BricsCAD users, improved feature called Convert Objects to Kogo. So let's go and fire this up. So the first thing you do is you're going to tell it what objects uh, you want to pick up, or what layer those objects exist on. So it does require good layer control, but I think most of the time we get our spot points coming through on the same layers. Not always, but sometimes. I'm going to go ahead and pick these. These are just, by the way, these are just um, AutoCAD points. OK, elevated at zero. The layer is called 3D points, but it's slightly misleading because they're not. Well, they are 3D. Just to clarify, a point in AutoCAD, OK, is 3D. An elevation at zero means it's 3D. It's just the fact that it's got no uh, elevation above that zero value. So the object type that we'd like to use for the elevation, OK, uh, oh, sorry, what is this object type? Let me start that again. This object is a point. We could be picking up a block or single line text or M text. So you could be limited to text on a job, but we've got at least we've got a point. Now it's going to create Kogo points for us. So how would you like to determine the elevation? Well, if there was an elevation on this 3D point, I would just say, look, use the object Z value. OK. 
in our case, we're going to be using not text content, sorry, but if we were picking up text, we would say go ahead and use the, um, the text value that is written in the text string. Attribute means, hey, I have an attribute. These are blocks that I'm picking up, which you can see here, block reference. There's an attribute in there, and that attribute contains the elevation. And I'd like to name that attribute in here to gain the elevation from the, uh, from the block. In our case, we're going to find nearest text. OK, it does a really, really good job here of just finding the nearest piece of text, even when there are text groups sort of bundled together, such as just up here. The text layer that we'd like it to use, and we're going to just head up here, is this one here. So we'll pick up the text layer, use those for the elevations, and create Kogo points. There's a few other extra bits in here which are related to how that is created. So text contents, I'm not going to talk about attributes. The description of the attribute can be applied in here as well. A lot of this content is now sitting outside on this particular uh, part of the form. The use default, this is actually quite important. This is the default code, which is applied to all the Kogo points. OK, so earlier we added, um, created a Kogo points that all had LP for low point. This is going to go ahead and create Kogo points with a code called NS. Not again, not hugely important if you're that fussed on Kogo points, um, but it is important in, re in regards to how the surface gets created. So leave that as NS. And then lastly, find nearest text. Again, these are all the controls which we've seen uh, earlier. So we can just leave these empty. Don't have to touch these. The big one is use default. OK, further down, we've got a point style. So this is going to create Kogo points which will look a certain way. OK, so this would be a point number, an elevation, a description, which is what we're going to be picking here. And then the code set table. So for those of you that are using um, the stringing features within civil site design, um, you can have these um, using particular code set tables. If you're not bothered, again, it doesn't matter. You can pick design code set. That's absolutely fine. Click on create Kogo points. And within a few seconds, we have a surface being created. OK, all the Kogo points are being added in. And you can see how it's done a very, very good job here of trying to pick up the Kogo points and the elevations in relation to the text. So there's the text for this particular Kogo point, 12.11. And it's done a very good job of finding that text. Now, if that is not quite right, and you may find that you, you know, you've got the odd one or two that haven't quite got the right elevation, let's just pick a clean one, maybe down here. You can left click on the, um, on the point. And if you can't see the point, OK, um, I'm this is this is actually I think this is the one area I'm just going to try down here. No. OK, what we might have to do is go via the uh, the ribbon up here. But on the surfaces tab for BritScad AutoCAD users and the site tab for uh, um, for civil 3D users, um, you can go edit point if you um, if you want for, for the AutoCAD um, civil 3D users, you actually have the option of seeing these grips. OK, and if you hover over the grip, you'll see that we have whoops, set dynamic position. That will allow you to go in and override the X, Y. The thing is about these Kogo points is they're intelligent. So if you try moving them around manually, they'll just revert back to their original state. And that's intended because the last thing you want is just to go in and just accidentally be moving Kogo points around, effectively changing your original 2D, oh, sorry, 3D topo survey and adjusting it. So this is where you change the position and this is where you can go and change the elevation through uh, resetting these values or changing these values in here. You've also got grips, okay? So you can adjust them. Again, if you're not interested in how they look, then that's absolutely fine. If you don't want one, all you do is just hit the delete key, okay? So you'll notice there's a surface being created and this was happening in the, um, the previous job um, when we were looking at the low points. Let's just explore where, this, where, where they're all going and why we get a surface. So if we have a look in CSD surfaces, under point group, a surface has been created. OK, and this actually exists in Surface Manager, Survey Surface, but no content in here is contributing towards how that surface is created. So where does it come from? So what we need to do is to expand point groups and right click and we'll simply actually just click on point groups, probably the easiest way. All that's happening is that all of the points are being put in a little group called, well, it doesn't really matter, all points or controllable surface points, and a surface is being created called survey surface. So as points come and go from this list, this surface is being updated. Now, this could be that you just want to simply now move on and start adding additional information to the surface and don't want it to have, uh, don't no longer want it to be connected back to your Kogo points. In which case, we can close this form down. We can head to surface manager. 
And there is a reference disconnect reference surface button. So this basically says, hey, stop using the Kogo points that we've got connected on the uh, point group. I'm going to click that button. And now I'm in a position to actually add other content. So I've actually got a couple of other layers, 3D faces, add, build. And we've got break lines here, which are 3D lines, add, and then build. I have a feeling by removing those first, I might have inadvertently uh, ruined my surface there, but that's absolutely fine. When I come to um, uh, rebuild my surface in the point group, let's go back to point group if it'll let me. It's not letting me at the moment. Bear with me, folks. It's going so well. Let's go. There we go. Point groups, just the right. There we go. All right. So what what's happening there is every time I basically go into the point group, it creates the surface and is appending all that other information that I've got added to it. OK, so for any point I want to disconnect, I would do it after you've added after you've added all the extra information that you've got in there. But this is a really, really good way of taking 2D information, getting it into 3D at the end of the day. Um, getting some kind of surface created from it without having to be running anything uh, overly manual, shall we say, through this process. So I'm hoping, really, uh, because we are well and truly over time, um, that covers everything that we've got in V24. And Todd, um, I guess over to you to see if there's any other sort of outstanding points to, to discuss. There's two outstanding questions, and one of them is very much related to what you were just showing, which mm -hmm. was the accuracy of the conversion of the 2D to the 3D. Um, and I'm guessing the question is about how accurate is it making the point? What's well, making the point based off the insert location of the source object? So that'd be the, in your case, those points that you were picking. Yep. And the level, the level accuracy will be the quality of the information you're given. Hence the 12.29 you've just highlighted. The point levels at. If that thing was the three decimal places, then the point that it creates would be the three decimal places. It's, it's not going to add and subtract data. It's just going to take what you've got and put it in. So you hopefully. Yeah, you can see it's not perfect either. Look, that no, that elevation, that one there should be. But then this is just down to the fact this is a very old survey. So yeah. this one is completely the wrong elevation, set dynamic position. That should be 12.61. So you need to go through and review it um, to, to ensure that, you know, you're getting the, the, the update. And in fact, I think if we right click and go uh, update Kogo points, what we should find is that, well, there's no difference, is it? Because at the end of the day, it's... Um, I think it should still be the same. But you, you're very much on the point. It's like that the software can automate the creation, but it still would be a wise course of action to review the, the creation of the surface for the points in this case to make sure yep. that they are creating the way you expect. Yeah, if you look, if you get 90% of them in the right spot, that for me, that's 90% <laughs> faster than anything else I would have done. So um, 100%. 100%. 100%. 100% faster than anything I would have done. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. Yeah, otherwise it's all manual creation of data it or is. like you say, list routines or some sort of... 3D extraction manipulation. It Correct. was never easy. Never easy. No. Um, and then the last question is actually nothing to do with these. It was all the IFC questions. Mm -hmm. So when you, you create a volume uh, and you export it out, so when you create a road and you create yep. it out as an expert, as an IFC no file. Volumes. Yep. No. No. It, that's the question. Yeah, no, there aren't. There will be. No. Um, there will be in, uh, we're waiting for, um, a uh, new piece of technology that's currently being developed within part of the technology that we've developed um, uh, to, to allow volume materials to come out. We will have it at some point. Uh, we're just waiting for that, to, that that new piece of tech to become available to us. Cool. I thought that was the answer. I just wasn't sure. And I was hoping yep. you knew. <laughs> we were literally asked that this week on our YouTube channel. Um, okay. Same question. Um, so that's hence why I know the answer. <laughs> Fantastic. That is it from questions perspective. Lovely. All right. Well, look, um, thank you very much for attending. Give us any of your feedback. Um, that can I'd be, I'd either be emailing myself direct. Todd, I'm not going to nominate you without having to have asked you first. Please email Todd. No, um, <laughs> email me if you would like. Um, I think the majority of you have my, uh, my email address. Um, feel free to drop me a line. Uh, if you've got any feedback on the tool space, have a look. You always at the use little... the, the tool space survey. That's yeah, another, that. another way to provide some feedback as well. Yeah. Um, and then the recording for this, um, yes. minus a few cheeky edits, uh, will be available <laughs> be available tomorrow. Sorry, Todd, I'm stealing all your, all you of are, your thunder I'm, I'm looking at all my notes that I'm supposed to talk about, and you, you're stealing every one. So I, I will <laughs> take the last one. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for a fantastic presentation. Pleasure. I hope everybody enjoyed it and got a glimpse of some of the new things that we've brought into 2000, and, sorry, 24 release of Civil Site Design. Um, it is backwards compatible for majority of platforms. So it'll go back down to, I think, what, Civil 3D? 2018. 
18, I was gonna say 18 or 19 and yep. AutoCAD the same and BricsCAD it'll go back to I think 21, 22 and 23. Um, and OEM wise, it's sitting on the OEM 23 base CAD platform because the 24 OEM hasn't come out yet. But yes, um, and all the keys should all be in the um, subscription portal. So all your subscription managers should be able to get the keys and update to the latest versions for those of you who are ready to install. Yeah, on that note, I think we are at the end. So there's a couple of questions come in, which are all just thank yous and fantastic. And um, some of our international customers are now going to bed. Um, yes. so we, we had some international guests viewing in. So thank you very much, guys, for making the absolute effort to, to join us at local time for us, um, which is completely out of time for you guys. So that is greatly appreciated as well. And yeah, yep. thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. We'll see Pleasure. you next time. Thank you very much. Cheers, Todd. Bye-bye, everyone. See ya.